Hello and welcome. Welcome to Puppets, Holidays, and Holy Days. I'm Vince Anthony, General Secretary of Unima USA, and I'm happy to see you here. I want to invite you to join Unima USA or to renew your membership. You can do that by looking at the slide that's going to appear on the screen. There you go. We're having a Valentine's membership drive. And if you join during the month of February, you get $5 off any level of membership. So we really in invite you to join as soon as you can or renew your membership. Now I'd like to introduce Kathy Foley. She's the immediate past president of Unima USA and your host for this wonderful program. Kathy. Welcome everyone. And thank you for coming. Uh, this series of Zooms has been an experiment for us to see if it's a way to gather people when we are so far apart. Um, I really want to thank all of the people who are presenting today. Of course, they're generously giving of their time, their art. Um, and I want to also invite you to let me know if you would be willing to do one of these. We only give people like 10 minutes and they have to pack all their wonderful work into a small amount of time. Uh, so it's a way of sharing the work across the country. Today we have, as always, three wonderful presenters. The way we're going to do it today is I'm going to introduce them all right now. After that, each of them will come on in turn. Um, I'll only appear if I'm trying to cut them off and warn them that they will have a minute or two to finish up. But at the end, we will have everybody come on screen, and that will be the time for questions. If you have any questions, don't hold them. As the person is talking, please put them into the chat. And at the end, we'll try any of them if we can. We like to keep this short and sweet. So we may run a few minutes over the hour, but also everyone is always willing to answer any of the questions. If you just send an email, all of these guys are in our UMA uh, membership directory, or you can find them online because they're also famous and doing things all the time with their company or school. So today we have three presenters. Our first one will be Manuel Antonio Maran Martinez. Uh, he will speak on Dream of Kings, storytelling, shadow puppetry, and sing-along production. Manuel was born in San Juan, Puerto Rico. He's worked as an actor, singer, writer, composer, puppeteer, theater and film director, and producer <laughs> in his country, Latin America, Europe, in the United States. As you all probably know, he's the founder and artistic director of Teatro Sea, the Society of Educational Arts Incorporated. It has offices in Puerto Rico, Florida, and New York City. Celebrating its 35th year in this, in 220, I guess, so it's already more. Its objective is to offer real entertainment as an alternative with cultural value and educational quality. It's for kids, for youth, for adults, through its bilingual educational programs, workshops, seminars, theater, and other cultural artistic expressions. So Manuel will take us to the epiphany first. Uh, for our second, we're moving chronologically, we'll go to Chinese New Year. Um, and Stephen Kaplan will present on Hao Bang Ah Zodiac. Chinese Theater Works annual productions for Lunar New Year with Chinese songs, idioms, stories, and audience games of the year's animal. So Stephen is a graduate of the Puppetry Arts Program at the University of Connecticut of NYU's Performance Studies Department 
Puppet production, design, and performance credits include work with Bread and Puppet Theater, Lee Brewer, Ping Chong, Susan Feldman, Teodora Skipataris, Julie Tamer, and George Wolf. He's a co-founding member of Great Small Works and is also co-founder and co-artistic director of Chinese Theater Works. Our final presentation will be for Budin, and that will be presented by Matthew Isaac Cohen. His presentation will be Huayang Esther performing the Book of Esther as a Javanese-style shadow puppet play for the holiday of Purim. He is a professor in the Department of Dramatic Arts at Yukon, a scholar practitioner specializing in global traditions of puppet theater, Indonesian performing arts, intercultural and transnational performance, and cultural heritage. He trained in traditional shadow puppet theater, and he performed both traditional and contemporary shadow puppet plays in Southeast Asia, Europe, and North America. He also writes lots of books and articles and many other things as well. So uh, I'm now gonna hand it over to Manuel. When Manuel has finished his, he will hand it over to Stephen, and then Stephen will hand it over to Matthew Cohen. So I won't see you until we do questions and answers, but please, uh, while this goes on, you can join Unima <laughs> when we're doing our transition breaks, but also put any questions that you have in the chat function so that we have your questions to address at the end of the presentations. So Manuel, take it away. Thank you, Kathy. Uh, hi, everyone. Hi, Vince. It's very nice seeing everyone. Hi, Karen. I haven't seen you in a while. Thank you for this opportunity and, and this invitation to talk about uh, the epiphany and what we do, uh, what I do, uh, what I have been doing for many years with the, uh, using puppetry to celebrate the epiphany. Since I only have 10 minutes, I decided to write my presentation, so I'm going to be uh, reading it. And then we'll talk after uh, if you have questions. Very good. I'm going to share the screen right here, my presentation. And can you all see it? Yes? Great. So here we go. So Epiphany is a Christian holiday celebrated on January 6, which commemorates the visit of the three wise men or Magi to the baby Jesus. According to the biblical story, the Magi follow a star and brought gifts of gold, frankincense, and mirth to the newborn king. The holiday is also referred to as Three Kings Day and is celebrated in many cultures with feast, gift giving, and other festivities. In the Christian tradition, Epiphany is considered a time of a spiritual renewal and is considered the 12th day of Christmas. Three Kings Day, or Dia de los Reyes Magos in Spanish, is a major holiday celebrated in Spain and Latin America Spanish-speaking countries, especially in Mexico and Puerto Rico, where I'm from. On this day, children receive gifts and sweets and families gather to celebrate with parades, feasts, and other festivities. In some countries, such as in Puerto Rico, it is customary to leave grass or hay under the bed for the wise men's candles. And in Mexico, children may place their shoes out to be filled with gifts. Uh, the celebration of the Three Kings Day is a mix of Christian and pre-Christian traditions and reflects the cultural diversity of Latin America and Spain. Giant puppets, also known as gigantes y cabezudos in Spanish, are a common feature of the Three Kings Day celebration in many Latin American and Spanish-speaking countries. These giant figures, typically representing the wise men, are parade through the streets accompanied by musicians and dancers to spread joy and celebration to the communities. And the use of giant puppets in the Three Kings Day celebration is thought to have originated in medieval times in Europe and has seen spread to Latin America, the Caribbean and Spain, where it has become a beloved tradition. 
The making of these giant puppets is a tradition, is a traditional art form passed down from generation to generation, and each puppet is unique, reflecting the creativity and cultural heritage of the local communities. The use of giant puppets in the Three Kings Day celebrations is a lively and colorful way to bring communities together and keep this important holiday alive. It is unclear when exactly the celebration of the Three Kings Day first started in New York City. However, it is known that Pura Belpre, a Puerto Rican librarian, puppeteer, and storyteller, played a significant role in introducing and promoting the tradition of the Three Kings Day in the city. Belpre worked as, as at the New York Public Library in the mid 20th century and used her storytelling and puppetry skills to bring the tradition of the Three Kings Day to life for children in the city. She's remembered today as, the, as a pioneer figure in promoting Puerto Rican culture and traditions through storytelling and puppetry in the United States, and her efforts helped lay the foundation for the continuous celebration of Three Kings Day in New York City. Her book, The Three Kings, was published in 1934, and this story retells the traditional tale of the three wise men and is told from a Puerto Rican perspective. Belpre's book is considered to be one of the first published works that brought Puerto Rican folklore and culture to a wider audience in the United States and is now considered a classic of Puerto Rican children's literature. So this is actually a flyer from one celebration of the Three Kings that she did, uh, Pura Belpre in 1938 um, at the New York Public Library. And this is another one, 1974, but or, that was at the Lincoln Center for Performing Arts. So El Museo del Barrio, uh, which is a, a Latino museum in New York City, has been celebrating the Three Kings Day for over four decades. And the celebration typically includes a parade featuring giant puppets of the three wise men or the three kings. The parade is a colorful and vibrant display that attracts crowds from all over the city and is a beloved event for many families and communities. My organization, Teatro Sea, which is also located in New York, is another organization that has been celebrating the Three Kings Day for the past 20 years. And like El Museo del Barrio, we're dedicated to preserving and promoting Latin American culture. And the Three Kings Day celebration is an important part of that mission. The celebration of Teatro Sea often includes traditional elements such as live Latino music, dance, and puppetry, as well as food and other festivities. And the first 1,000 kids that arrive at the theater receive a gift, usually it's a toy and a book, from the Three Kings themselves. For many months, we do uh, toy drives so we can provide to the kids. The, um, actually, I think I had a video here, but it's not working, so we continue. No worries. So this is like such a great way to for families and communities to come together to celebrate this important uh, holiday tradition. So for many years, I wanted to do more than a festival, even though I've been doing this uh, festival for 21 years. Um, and I wanted to do a theater performance. And when we finally got the okay to open the theater in December, 2021, after almost two years of being closed because of the pandemic, we opened with a new production called Sueño de Reyes, Dream of Kings, written and directed by myself. And the show featured shadow puppets of the three kings, Gaspar, Melchior, and Balthazar, and many more, created by the renowned shadow puppeteer from India, Shinde Chitabara Rao. I met Shinde uh, in a puppet festival while I was in India in a Unima meeting, and I commissioned him to make the puppets through my friend and colleague, uh, Daddy Pujumbi. Pujumbi. So Shinde uh, is a traditional, oh, sorry. Why, is, why can't we cannot see him? Well, anyway, we can see him right here. Yes. So Shinde Chitambara Rao is a traditional puppeteer from the Indian state of Karnataka. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that right, but I'm reading it. So Karnataka is a state located in the south, southwestern region of India, and it is known for its rich cultural heritage, including its traditional puppetry arts. And he's considered a master in the field of shadow puppetry and has received recognition for his contributions to this ancient art form. Shadow puppetry, also known as Tavilu Ata in the local language, 
is a form of storytelling that involves creating and manipulating figures made from animal hides or leather that are illuminated from behind to create the illusion of movement. Shinde has been practicing this art form for many years and has passed down his knowledge to, and skills to future generations of puppeteers. He has also been instrumental in preserving and promoting the cultural heritage of shadow puppetry in India. My show included shadow puppets, actors, and live musicians. Uh, we sang Latin American songs in a Latin jazz rhythm. And we um, actually, these are some pictures of the of when he was building the puppets. So for, the, for my show. So we sing Latin American songs in Latin jazz rhythm, and we, the three kings actually themselves, they tell the story of how they accidentally ended up in the neighborhood Bethlehem in Puerto Rico instead of Bethlehem in Judea. It is a creative, funny, and unique retelling of the traditional three king story and a wonderful way to celebrate and keep the traditional, uh, the traditional life. Through the use of puppetry, one of the few forms of popular theater that we have left, we are exposing and educating audiences not only about this Iberian and Latin American tradition, but also about puppetry, traditional, about traditional Indian puppetry. Puppetry in celebrating this holiday help us to um, preserve culture, to preserve and promote Latin American culture, cultural traditions, which can be threatened by assimilation and the loss of heritage, community building, which provides an opportunity for families and communities to come together and, uh, and to share and the celebration and, prom and promote the sense of unity and belonging, educating future generations so younger generations can learn about their cultural heritage and gain a deeper appreciation of their roots, maintaining religious traditions for those who observe the Three Kings Day as a religious holiday, Keeping the tradition alive helps to maintain and reinforce their spiritual beliefs and to celebrate diversity. This is a way of celebrating diversity and promoting tolerance and understanding among different cultures. Overall, the celebration of the Three Kings Day is an important part of Latin American cultural heritage and keeping the tradition alive through storytelling, music, and puppetry help us to maintain and celebrate this rich cultural legacy for future generations. So that's me. Uh, if you can see, I'm one of the kings. I've been playing a king for 21 years already. <laughs> and that was actually the day of the, when we opened in 2021, during the middle of the pandemic, we looked like astronauts because we had those masks, uh, <laughs> transparent masks. Of this year, we did it finally without masks, uh, but we, we were all only able to do two performances of that show on 2021 because then Omicron came and we had to close the theater again uh, for a couple of months. So just to finish my presentation, I wanna let you know that the, the, uh, the 58 puppets that Master Shinde uh, did for us, we're turning them into a book as well. So this is some of the illustrations of the book. So that's all my presentation. Thank you very much. Stephen, you're up next. Hello, everybody. So glad to be here. And I'm going to talk a little bit about um, my work with Chinese Theatre Works and um, some of the shows we've done celebrating Chinese holidays and, and also Jewish holidays. So when Kuang Yufang and I started Chinese Theatre Works in the mid-1990s, we faced a lot of challenges as an interracial couple and also as collaborative artists and business partners, we had to navigate a lot of the cultural differences between Chinese and Western culture. Um, and we had to work it out on a lot of different levels. But in the process, we managed to create together dozens of original productions. Um, oh, sorry um dozens of original pr productions which blended together um more or less seamlessly chinese and western traditional and contemporary performance practices 
Each year, CTW presents between 70 to 100 public events of traditional um, and programs. And these take place over throughout the five boroughs of New York City and beyond. Our home range where we're touring is divided by large bodies of water that are tunneled under or spanned over by magnif magnificent bridges. And the audiences uh, at the theaters, festivals, museums, schools, libraries, parks, and streets where we play are from every corner of the planet Earth. So to serve them well, we've had to make works that cross over or dig under all the divisions of language and culture. And of course, we've relied very heavily on puppetry as our preferred medium. And I'm gonna turn on my PowerPoint now. Doink, share. Is it up there? It is. Oh. It is good. Okay. So um, we can go into the slideshow though. Right now we're seeing the power. Oh, sorry. Yep. Board. You're right. You're right. Okay. I'm sorry. Uh, a slideshow play from start. There we go. Okay. Um, uh, uh, our early productions used a wide variety of puppetry styles, uh, but we became interested in particular with the China, these small glove puppets, Wu Dai Shi, uh, they're called, um, because they had so much in common with Chinese opera in repertoire, in choreography, staging, and design. But at the time we were beginning, we lacked um, basic manipulation skills and puppets to follow through. So our immersion only began in earnest when we uh, met up with a young Taiwanese puppeteer Wu Shan Huang. Oh, there we are in performance. Uh, Wu Shan Huang uh, had begun his training as a young, at a young age, with a great Taiwanese puppet master, Li Tian Lu, who is the founder and director of the renowned Yi Wan Ran Puppet Theater in Taiwan. And Wu Shan had received a travel grant from the Asia Cultural Council to come to New York and study. And he was referred to by one of Kuang Yu's colleagues to, to us. Um, we were very happy to get to know him and get to sample his great skills in traditional hand puppetry and to introduce him to other puppeteers in the city. Uh, some years later, we invited him back to stay with us for a month and work with us, um, conduct wor workshops and tour and in exchange, he asked from us that we teach him the process of creating original puppetry works because the training he got in a traditional troupe only presented very old static repertoire and he wanted to make his own shows. So Kuang Yu suggested that we start with a well-known Taiwanese folk song, T-O-O, about a farmer's couple, farmer farming couple's daily life, and we use that as a starting point. Um, over the years, over, over our work with him, Wushan worked with us extensively and coached us in the fine points of, of uh, working with these wonderful Budaishi puppets, teaching us choreography for some of the well-known classic routines, like this one for Wusheng Fights the Tiger. And he also connected us with puppet makers in Taiwan so that we could purchase uh, a varied collection of well-crafted Budaishi puppets and props and costumes. Uh, he, Wushan also helped us with the choreography of the first of a series of hand puppet productions that we started making annually every year in honor of the Chinese Lunar New Year. Uh, we call them Haobanga Zodiac. Uh, Haobanga is a popular expression in Mandarin meaning great, super, Awesome. And these shows tried to be all of that. The Haobanga shows were designed for culturally diverse audiences. And they consisted of a series of short puppet skits based on folk idioms, uh, literary references. And we also um, introduced a lot about the Chinese New Year customs, games, and songs that were done around this festival, which is one of the biggest uh, holidays in the Chinese calendar. 
Uh, each year, the episodes, each year's episode would be hosted by the current uh, Zodiac animal. There's the sheep from not so long ago and the dogs, pigs, mice, ox, tigers. Ah, we love the tigers. And this year's uh, star is the bunnies, of course. So uh, there's a selection of it. <clears throat> Excuse me, flip the page. Um, so these small scale shows traveled all over the city um, and they were perennial hits with our audiences, especially uh, these last couple of weeks when we've been able to go back to full touring again and we've had really awesome crowds who are really loving the idea of seeing theater in purpose in 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 person again um uh and this work with the budaishi puppets uh sparked uh my interest in sparked another project that i want to talk about briefly and uh it was called budaishi purim puppet spiel and I want to keep this brief because Matthew is going to go in great depth about Purim. But we, I was, I was originally um, uh, sparked in this project by my work with Great Small Works in a show that featured two great Jewish, um, New York Jewish artists from the early 30s, Yossi Cutler and Zuni Maud, who had founded the Modi Cut Puppet Theater, the first Yiddish language puppet theater in America. And during the research phase, I, oh, that's out of order. There's Bunny. I went uh, to Evo, which is the Yiddish folk um, archive in New York City with Jenny Romaine, my colleague from Great Small Works. And um, we got to see some of the puppets that Yussel, uh, that Cutler and Maud had made for their 1930s radical leftist rendition of the traditional puppet uh, Purim story. Um, now, traditional Jewish culture doesn't have a lot of room for puppetry or performance, but an exception is made for this holiday of Purim, which is, at least in European tradition, has really strong kind of carnivalesque atmosphere to it, which includes a lot of folk performances and stuff. And these are what um, sparked uh, Zuni, uh, Cutler, and Maud in doing their production. And they got me thinking about how we could do this with our Budaishi animal puppets. So I floated the idea with the cantor at the temple where I was going regularly for synagogue services, and he got very excited by the idea. So together, we put together a, a fast-moving piece that premiered at Temple Gate of Prayers in Flushing Town. Uh, this is this is one of the pieces from it uh one of the scenes there it is on the bima right behind the rabbi there the chazan who was working with us on it is what was over there singing and doing the voices for a lot of the characters um it was a really big hit <laughs> so we started uh touring it to other jewish cultural venues as well and this strange Jewish-Chinese hybrid has been one of my favorite CTW projects because, not only because it fused together my personal religious and cultural backgrounds with the radicality of Great Small Works and Chinese theater works, traditional puppetry expressions, all into one project, but it also represented for me a very practical model for how puppetry can successfully blend traditional and modern performance practices and serve as a platform for creating new vibrant cross-cultural performance. So that's most of what I want to say. Before I hand it over to Matthew, though, I want to show you a little 90 second uh, uh, promo we made of this, of our little video. Uh, if you find it, uh, how do I get out of here? In slideshow, click to exit. Thank you. Uh, let me pull it up and then uh, here we go. Okay, oops, I gotta share first. Hold on. Ah. Uh, let me see, share screen. Where are we? I'm sorry, folks. 
Here we go. Share screen. Dunk. Uh, we can do. Do you want me to share it? I have it up. Yes, yes. If you don't mind. Okay, that'll make it much easier. <laughs> Thank you. Here it is. A little uh, from uh, Udaishi Purim Puppet Spiel. Your Majesty, I... the glorious ruler of the Persian Empire is pleased to elevate Haman, the Agagite. Above all the princes in the land. Step Let's do this. <laughs> uh, your Majesty, I have a message here for you. Oh. Hmm. I know what I must do. Okay, well, hope you enjoyed that, and I'll pass the baton to Matthew Cohen. Thanks, Stephen. Um, I'm going to start with a video and then move on to a uh, presentation PowerPoint. Let's hope this works. Oh, no. Of course, it doesn't work when you want it to work. Um, I'll try again. No, 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 no. Technical failures all around. Okay, let's try this again. Sorry, folks. Sharing screen, sharing sound. Can we hear the sound? That was a little excerpt or excerpts from a production called Wang Esther, which was staged or revived at the, uh, the Jewish Community Center in West Hartford in 2022, last year for Purim, the Jewish holiday, which Stephen Kaplan uh, just discussed as well. Uh, and this will be included in a, a, a part of a documentary film about uh, various kinds of uh, modern Wang forms called Wang Worlds which will debut in another month or so. It's a collaboration with an Indonesian filmmaker. 
Um, I'd like to give some background to this production, which I think, uh, like uh, the Budaishi poem and Manuel's Three Kings, might serve as a model for future uh, productions, which uh, bring together uh, puppeteers and creative minds together with religious communities uh, in an active exchange. Uh, and I think furthering of, uh, uh, of both the religious and artistic projects. Uh, why on Kulit, the, the Shadow Puppet Theater, uh, most closely associated with the island of Java, um, at least until very recently, has been performed primarily in the context of ritual or ceremonial events. Uh, so it's an integral part of weddings and circumcisions, Thanksgiving uh, events put on by communities and families. Uh, and in this context, it nor was normally the case, at least until very recently, that the play selected by the puppeteer for performance uh, was programmed, in effect, by the event uh, in which it was contextualized. So, for example, an event uh, celebrating the, a woman's first pregnancy would require a play about the birth of one of Wyong's heroes, an event which was put on a community uh, for a, a ritual cleansing of a, of a village would involve a play uh, featuring the rice goddess Sri. Uh, in contrast, in my experience performing Wyong and witnessing performances over the last 35 years or so, um, outside of Southeast Asia, we see Wyong mostly contained within secular contexts. Uh, it's intended uh, to entertain, to educate audiences about a distant culture, build solidarities between Indonesia and other countries, or maybe explore the artistic potentials of Wang as an artistic medium, but rarely, in my experience at least, uh, involving uh, a religious uh, or spiritual element. Uh, and there's some exceptions to that. I'll show you, uh, uh, again, I'll share sc screen again. Um, Uh, a performance I did in 2017 at the Yale University Art Gallery um, was intended to uh, mark the inauguration of the world largest uh, wine collection at Yale and was intended to dispel any lingering malignant influences. And together with uh, some of the uh, Japanese members of the Gamelan Ensemble, the musical ensemble accompanying this performance, which was based at Yale, uh, we included a number of ritual offerings and actions as a way of dispelling uh, any kind of lingering uh, elements which might have been imported accidentally uh, into, uh, into the concepts of an Ivy League uh, university. Um, but this performances like this are, have been the exception in my experience. Um, recollecting the success of this uh, uh, propitious uh, uh, Yale performance, and the tradition of theme plays connected uh, to ritual events uh, 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 and ritual context in Java, um, I thought long and hard about which play to perform when I was approached initially in 2021 by a local philanthropist to perform uh, a puppet show at the Mandel uh, uh, Jewish Community Center uh, uh, around the time of a holiday of Purim. Um, and it had been the um, intention of the funder, uh, of a local philanthropist, to bring together the Yukon puppet uh, uh, program together with uh, the Jewish community of West Hartford, where I live, uh, into a productive cultural dialogue. Um, and uh, but uh, fortunately, as I as I began to do some research and turning to people, including Stephen Kaplan, to do this research, I discovered. In fact, that there is a history um, of uh, poor and puppet plays that goes back at least a century. Uh, it builds on this well-known uh, Ashkenazi Jewish tradition of the Purim spiel, in which the story about the salvation of the Jews uh, 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 of the ancient Persian kingdom of Shushan uh, by the virtuous Queen Esther and her uncle Mordechai uh, from a plot which is uh, machinated by the king's evil minister, Haman. Uh, uh, this story is enacted as puppet plays uh, or in, normally as, as, as uh, human drama. Uh, it's the same story which is uh, chanted from a parchment scroll or Megillah uh, in uh, synagogues on Purim. 
and is then acted, uh, as I said, sometimes also by uh, human uh, uh, actors, mostly amateurs in community-based comical farces, which follow immediately from the, uh, um, the, the service. Uh, so there, there's a history of going back at least a century of these poor uh, plays done with puppets. Uh, Stephen Reddy mentioned the Muttacut production. Uh, there are performances, also, other productions as well in English. Uh, which 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 I discovered in the course of doing research, but it was uh, among these diverse uh, dramatic vehicles, the one that really called out to me uh, as most suitable for revival was a music theater piece with words and music by composer writer Barbara Benari, uh, titled uh, "Wang Esther: A Javanese Purim Spiel," uh, and this 2001 composition combines oratorio with Gamelan and Javanese puppets. And it was written for Benari's own ensemble, Gamelan, Son of Lion, a pun on Benari's name. Um, Benari means uh, Son of Lion in, in Hebrew, uh, an ensemble which he co-founded in 1976 and uses as its core musical instruments a Gamelan or a gong chime ensemble, which is based on Javanese uh, tradition. Uh, Wang Esther is a follow-up in a way to an earlier uh, 1994 work called Karna, a shadow puppet opera, uh, which was performed at La Mama Theater in New York originally. Um, but unlike uh, Karna, which uh, draws on uh, a standard source for Javanese shadow puppet theater, the Mahabharata, Wang Esther is based on the, on the Book of Esther and the Jewish interpretive tradition of finding contemporary resonances for ancient uh, scripture. Uh, and so in the original production, uh, in 2001, the work highlights the theme of ethnic cleansing, uh, making uh, Haman's attempt to kill all the Jews of the empire, and Mordecai's response to this plot, uh, killing Haman and his sons, uh, in an effort to stamp out Amalek, uh, the arch enemies of the Jewish people, as a kind of a parallel narrative to the Yugoslav wars of the 1990s, uh, and bringing thus a really contemporary resonance to this to this play. Um, and uh, I was a hugely admirer uh, um, of uh, admirer of, of of the musical aspects of Wang Esther, but saw uh, a potential for developing the theatrical elements uh, in a production two decades later. And working together with Son of Lion, Bonari had passed away sadly a couple of years ago, but the her Gamon group uh, continued, uh, as well as students from the uh, Yukon's puppet arts programs. We made a radical reworking of the of the work. Um, so, for among with six real uh, modifications, uh, in the original, um, all the characters spoke in English, but in our production, the main characters spoke entirely in biblical Hebrew, with interpretations um, supplied by the clown servants. You can see here in the middle of this slide, Samar, one of those clown servants, and this is a practice which resonates with the uh, wine coup that is performed in Bali where clowns interpret uh, the words of the, the heroes. Uh, the original songs were sung uh, in the original production by professional singers, dialogue as well, by mostly by singers. Um, but I had all the dialogue uh, allocated to me as, as dialogue, as puppeteer, um, and was able to thus improvise anew uh, each, each uh, rendition of the play, uh, even if the, uh, uh, the, the, the song texts were fixed. Um, we commissioned as well a new set of puppets based on illuminated Megillah scroll. It's telling me I'm, I'm almost out of time. Um, and and uh, these came, were designed by Joko Susilo in New Zealand, uh, who is a puppeteer in the original production, one of my teachers, and then made uh, in uh, Central Java. Um, we also incorporated, uh, interpolated, OHP sequences on the, uh, these are shadow puppetry on the overhead projector, which was created as commentaries on the songs uh, uh, and ran in parallel with the Wang action. And inspired by the work of uh, Chicago's Manual Cinema, we uh, uh, both had the uh, shadow puppets being seen the, uh, as the puppeteers manipulate the puppets, as well as them being uh, thrown up on the back wall. Um, and we performed uh, uh, this uh, both for children and adults, and thus had two different versions of the play, uh, one with uh, the rather gruesome uh, massacres at the end and a plaintive uh, prayer for redemption, Vidui, 
another ending in a single along of once there was a wicked, wicked man. Um, I'd be happy to talk more about this production in the Q&A, as well as the accompanying exhibition, uh, which brought together various kinds of uh, Purim puppets, some interactive elements as well, uh, and the kind of learning which happened uh, for the students, uh, both the Yukon students and uh, the uh, preschool children who were involved in many ways in this production. I look forward to the discussion. Thank you. Okay, I want to call the other presenters back on the screen. So Stephen and Manuel, can you turn on your microphones? And yes. <clears throat> so uh, thank you. You guys are amazing, and you only took your ten minutes or so. <laughs> You're unlike the other people in the previous ones where I had to come and cut them off. <laughs> so I'm overwhelmed. <laughs> you well, I left a few points out. I could go on. Yeah, no, clearly. Uh, um, the things that I'm seeing in the uh, the chat have been mostly uh, wonderful work, beautiful rabbits, uh, gorgeous stuff. Uh, there's one comment from Michael Schuster, which says, in medieval Europe, Jews also performed versions of the Joseph story for Purim. So Matt, that's clearly got to be your next production is Joseph <laughs> for medieval Purim. But somebody says they joined Unima. Thank you. And Vince Anthony, thanks you. Uh, so put your things. I want to put a question to all of you. I'm totally amazed at about how intercultural all of the uh, examples that you gave. I thought I was choosing something Christian, something Chinese, something uh, you know Jewish or things like that, although I knew there was Wyong in it. But you know, it just makes me wonder, uh, you're talking about the history of some of these other things, but do you see a history of other people who've done this immense kind of intercultural uh, melding of, you know, wh whatever your your holiday is? And if so, you know, uh, could you react to that? Or is it something that is sort of new and a product of our contemporary society? So that's a question sort of for each of you. Stephen. I well, I think in New York City, it's kind of what the landscape is. And Emmanuel knows this too. It's even, I mean, we do do a lot of work for the Chinese community, but most of our audiences are not from there. And so you really have to be able to serve the cultural group that you're kind of focused at, but also include everybody else on the planet and especially in queens where we're located it's just such a diverse mash of people from every corner of the globe it's it's really so you go for the universal <laughs> i guess is what it is you, you 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 know you're presenting in one language or once one cultural uh form frame but projecting it out to to everybody else so I wanted to add to that, that was my answer as well. We're in New York City and in New York City, you have to um, not only, you know, you're very cultural specific, but at the same time, you know, you're celebrating heritage with your, with your own cultural, you know, group, but at the same time, you're teaching and sharing with other cultural groups that are learning, you know, about you, that are willing to learn, that are willing to join. Uh, for the past 21 years that I've been doing the Three Kings Day Festival at the Lower East Side, um, I mean, we definitely get a huge amount of Latino, Latinos, but we get from all cultures, from Asian, the Asian community, from like even Muslim community, and we get from all religions. And you, it's amazing that they can all come and enjoy our, our food, enjoy the performances, sing with us, dance with us. It's a beautiful thing to combine and to share what you have with everybody else. So that's what we do in New York. 
So just again, uh, the research I did towards this production of Wang Esther, I uncovered all this shadow puppet work in Germany in the 1920s, um, mm -hmm. including uh, work which was done by Zionist uh, uh, performers and directors and artists. Uh, and one of these companies active in the 1920s, many of them made Aliyah to Israel uh, with the rise of Nazism. They, they fled Germany. Uh, but one of these couples was explicitly working with Wyan. Um, they were using Javanese style puppets. Uh, they were aware of Wyan. They were talking about Wyan as uh, their influence. So I think it goes back some time. It's part of the history of 20th century puppetry uh, to work interculturally and not only within one cultural domain, but you know, creating these kind of bridges and combinations. So it's not only New York, but I think it's part of the, the our, our shared history. Yes. Uh, there, there's a question, uh, this is especially for the New York people, does being a puppet theater in New York, the heart of the U.S. theater, add pressures that you oh, yes. might not have in other places? Yes, for me it does. Um, I, I run a, a very, I mean, like a, a regular season. I have a theater uh, on the Lower East Side, and my productions are competing with so many other productions in the city, even Broadway now, half of Broadway is called theater for your audiences, which I, I, I have issues with that. But um, so I, I, sometimes I want to do something very simple, very small scale. And, and the audiences are actually expecting more spectacle because we're in New York. So mm -hmm. that is actually one of my major challenges. Um, uh, I do I do my small things too, but I do have to cater for the for for the expectations of the audience, which is more spectacle. So a lot of color, new live music, um, like you know that kind of thing. So that is that is happening. Uh, yes. Yeah, and I guess Chinese theater works. We don't have to run our own theater, which is phew, I don't know if I could deal with that, but. <laughs> We are, and we're also out in the boroughs, which is a very different space than where Manuel is in Manhattan. And that's where that's where things are really a big mashup. And we we work small because uh, we have a small space here. <laughs> and we have to fit everything into our uh, little Subaru to drive out to the gigs. So that and alone sort of sort of uh, sets the limits to what we can do and within those limits though um you can do an awful lot and and little sometimes is great so you know great small that's the other part of my work <laughs> great small works okay um yeah it does work though it works small um this i think is for manuel and yes. it's about gifts do I, I... some kids get both christmas gifts and the epiphany gifts. Yes, yes. Actually, in my case, uh, I mean, I'm a father, but I, I also, as a kid, uh, the biggest gift uh, that I would get, it was on January 6th. It wasn't on, on Christmas. We would get a nice gift on Christmas, like everybody else, but the biggest, the most important one was in, in during the epiphany. Um, and actually, I'm doing the same thing with my son now. Um, the only sad thing is that here, the Three Kings Day is not January 6th, it's not a holiday. And now, because what happened in January 6th, uh, the Capitol, now it has become, you know, have damaged our celebration because now the media is now celebrating that instead of being, I mean, not celebrating, remembering that instead of being you know, celebrating uh, our tradition, uh, traditional holiday. Uh, and also we get gifts for the kids, like usually I mentioned the first 1,000 kids, but we have gotten close to 3,000 people on January 6th in our theater on the Lower East Side, and we get gifts for everybody. Yes. Okay. Um, Jody Diamond has had a few questions. Uh, one is about changing the stories for children. Uh, perhaps it's for Matt around. Uh, you know, the poor and or, or maybe for all of you, yeah. you know, to, to what extent do you change the stories and what does that mean? And do you feel that uh, for audiences, they're, they're coming to see these productions for, you know, adults, or is it mostly parents bringing their children 
to and and how does that make you think about the pr production that you're creating? You add something one? to that. Can I'm sorry. Uh, I I wanted to say that that in my could I, could I please add something because that's not the point I want to make. Okay. okay. So Jody. I think she's frozen. So it may not be yes. the exact. I, I want yeah. to frozen. Shoot. Oh. Okay, Jody, do you want to? Okay. Try can it? you hear me now? We can hear you now. Okay. All right. I mean, you, your summation of my question brought up my other question, which is, what do we do about people thinking puppets are for children? Period no matter how sophisticated or difficult the performance is. But I don't know if um, you're aware of the, the work of Ruth Crawford Seeger and um, her husband, Charles Seeger, in collecting American folk songs. And they felt very strongly that singing these songs was how children learn to deal with things that we... Th I think we lost her again. So perhaps any of you can respond to that question. Think of tragedy. So, you know, my daughter grew up hearing about. No, 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 no. So I, I, I mean, what I wanted to say, if I understood half of the question, is that is that uh, when I write and direct a puppet theater, I do it for both with two readings one for the children and one for for the the adult audiences, and I do get. Uh, people coming, you know, we, without kids to see the shows. So there's adult. Obviously, even though we we are a theater for young audiences, we also have a series like the, the International Puppet Fringe Festival and Micro Theater Festival that we do. That is for is puppetry for adults and the cabarets and the slams that we do. But um, mostly, uh, we are a theater for young audiences. And my audiences sometimes there's more adults than kids, especially for the general audiences. Sometimes the parents and the comes, I mean, the kids come with grandma, grandpa, everybody. So it's four people bringing one kid. So, um, and the, the adults always have an amazing experience um, because they remember their, their childhood. They also, there's a lot of politics in, in the writing that I, you know, that I do. Uh, you know, my, I think my work is very political. And and you know and they read uh, all from 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 what what I'm presenting. So I'm actually directing and writing for both audiences at the same time. Yeah, I I think I think I use a lot of those same strategies too in ours. I mean, my background was in the avant-garde kind of theater and bread and puppet and great small works, which was not for kids at all really. But CTW really does have mixed audiences and we make different versions or we play the same show different ways for different audiences so if it's mostly kids uh under third grade or so you play it one way if it's teenagers you play it totally different and if it's a mixed audience then then you can really play play it like it's for adults and the kids will laugh along with the adults even they may not understand the joke they know it's funny and they respond accordingly. So it really works best. I find mixed audiences of adults and kids really are the most lively, most fun to play to for. Matthew, do you have anything you want to throw in on that at all? I think Manuel and Stephen have said it very well. Okay. Um, this am, am I back? the last question. Uh, the oh, okay. All right. people are asking, uh, with the rise of secularism uh, in, you know, closing of churches, slimming down of Christianity, even though parts of it have risen um, very strongly, uh, what do you think about that for these kinds of events that are attached to a specific religious or cultural tradition that may be fading away. I, I could speak a little bit to that in context being Connecticut, which has a clearly declining Jewish population. 
But for many Jews here, the expression of, of religious identity is more and more through the arts, uh, rather than going being affiliated with a, a synagogue. Uh, and uh, film festivals, exhibitions, uh, documentary film, I mean, many, many things uh, have, have provide a point of of you know religious identity uh, without the uh, ritual, without the liturgy. So I think this might be a, even more important in, the, in this current context, uh, providing events which are thought provoking, which engage different kinds of audiences, bring together families. Um, I, th I think has real real significance at this moment. Yeah, here. I mean, across the world, most a, most traditional puppet forms are really rooted strongly in in religious traditions and teachings and and core values that get embedded in within these performances. That's why they're so powerful. That's why they last for centuries and centuries, and they they still have power. Maybe more than so because there aren't that many other avenues for this kind of transmission of core cultural values left that are sort of universal, more or less universal values. Yeah, it's so, so puppetry, I think, really does have a role in both these uh, religious and also secular uh, worldviews. Well, in my case, working with schools in New York City, you know, that's the first question they ask, uh, is this religious? How can we do a show about the epiphany without mentioning baby Jesus? I mean, that's impossible. So, um, but we have uh, a, like really, you know, the show is not to convert people to Christianity. It's about folklore. It's about how Latinos, you know, celebrate this, this tradition. And now even we combine it uh, with, with Indian puppetry, which is totally something non-related to the Latino uh, uh, so, so there's a lot of other elements, and the schools do come, and 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 we and we have wonderful questions from the teachers and the parents and the kids uh, to, about about the traditions and also about the the Christian celebration as well. So I think it is an experience. It is something that you know uh, that we're not converting people. We're just expressing, you know, uh, and and showing uh, images and imagery and and singing songs. I mean that do mention Jesus, but not necessarily Christian. I think that's thinking about the book of Esther. That's one of the ways it appeals that it's the book of the Bible, which doesn't mention God, right? So it really, the story can be interpreted as an entirely secular story about uh, resilience and overcoming, uh, uh, you know, from terrible threat of, uh, existential threat of genocide. Um, but it, it it's not necessarily a religious story and that, that way I, again yeah. just two other leaders that just because of we just finished a month ago with this show um many people it's funny because when i said it has two different readings that many people who are non-religious they see the show for folklore and some other people say oh manuel that was such a spiritual show for me and i'm like okay so it, there you see how people read um, a, a, an art show a performance okay i think that is a wonderful way for us to end. I think you are all doing really important work, uh, you know, in that kind of blending that, you know, lets people talk across culture and reaching down for the essentials within the idea of holy day or holiday, which is what are our best principles as human beings? How can we live well with each other? And that, of course, is always what I think attracts us all to this wonderful art of puppetry. Um, I want to remind people before we let you go that World Puppetry Day will be happening on March 19th, I believe, at five o'clock. And yes, we'll be March announcing. 19th. Yeah, yeah. Vince, do you want to? Well, I just wanted to say, and I think. We lost you, Vince. We, your microphone is off. Can you hear me now? Yes. Just wanted to say, well, thank you for joining us today. And we hope you'll join us on March 19th for World Property Day, where we're going to give out awards that day. 
And also, I think popping up on your screen in a minute is our special offer for uh, good for Valentine's Day. All during the month of February, we have a special offer of $5 off any membership level. So we hope people will join or renew their memberships today at unimausa.org. Thank you all for joining us. Kathy, thank you. And Stephen and Manuel and, and uh, M Matthew, thank you all so much for sharing your wonderful knowledge with us. Thanks yeah. for inviting us. Great work. I learned a lot. Thank you.